we're in a moment where we should have real concerns about the uses that new database technologies are being put to. So, and all I mean when I say that are things like predictive analytics, or automated decision-making tools, uh, algorithms, um, because they're having just a massive impact on our communities and we're often not having the political conversations we should be having about what that means. And so for the past close to 10 years, I've been working on um, a, a book that I just finished called uh, Automating Inequality, How High-Tech Tools Profile Police and Punish the Poor, where I tell a number of stories about how these new technologies are being integrated into public services uh, across the country. So I talk about um, an automated decision-making machine, an automated eligibility system in welfare in the state of Indiana. Um, an electronic registry that's supposed to match the most vulnerable unhoused people with the most appropriate available resource in Los Angeles, and a predictive model that's supposed to be able to guess which children might be victims of abuse or neglect in the future in Allegheny County, which is in um, uh, near Pittsburgh, is the county that Pittsburgh is in. I think mostly what's missing is the point of view of the families who feel targeted by these systems, right? So the systems that I talk about in Automating Inequality are all um, targeted at poor and working families. Um, and from their point of view, these systems often look really different. So they feel like um, that they're being diverted from shared resources that they are entitled to and deserve and need to, to um, keep their families safe and healthy. Um, so in Indiana, for example, um, they created an automated eligibility system that denied a million welfare applications in the first three years um, that it was working, um, which is a 50% increase from the three years before the tool was introduced. Um, and there, we are also seeing families who feel like, or I'm hearing from families, um, that they also feel like they are being subjected to a kind of punitive scrutiny, um, which actually makes them more vulnerable, even though it's often talked about as um, bringing them more resources or identifying risk sooner. Um, families actually often feel like they're being criminalized um, for decisions they haven't even made yet. So uh, one of the origin stories I tell about the creation of the book is um, I've been working both in welfare rights and economic justice movements for a long time and also in community technology. So I sort of came up uh, in the 90s in the Bay Area of California as a community technology activist. Um, and so I've spent a lot of my life building out resources in collaboration with marginalized communities um, around the country. And I was sitting in one of these labs that I helped build in my hometown of Troy, New York, in um, what was basically an, uh, it was a residential YWCA. So it was kind of like a single room occupancy hotel for low income women. And I was sitting there one day with um, somebody I worked really closely with who goes by a pseudonym in the book. Uh, she goes by Dorothy Allen in the book. And we were talking about her electronic benefits transfer card, her EBT card. Um, and uh, she said, oh, you know, they're great. Uh, they're, they they you know, lower stigma in the grocery store and they're a little bit more convenient. She said, but you know, at the same time, my caseworker uses it to track all of my spending and all of my movements. And I must have had this like super shocked look on my face because she then said, oh, right, like you didn't know that. And then got really, she sort of laughed at me for a minute, but then she got really thoughtful and she said, oh, Virginia, you know, you, you all, meaning sort of professional middle class people, you all should pay attention to what's happening to us, which moms on welfare, because they're coming for you next. And I really feel like that insight was hugely important for my work, both because it helped me remember to start uh, where problems are most uh, clear, most obvious, and most pressing, which is often in uh, historically disadvantaged communities. Um, but also it reminded me that um, often people who live in places that you could think of as low rights environments um, serve as sort of canaries in the coal mine for these new technologies. They're experimental populations for our most sort of intrusive, invasive technologies. And so if we care about social justice, um, then that's where we need to start, is in places like the welfare office, in places like prisons, um, in places like refugee camps. That's where we need to start. 
So one of the things that's really great about being where we are right now, which is at the 2018 Allied Media Conference, um, is that it is this incredible space where we have really difficult conversations about media and technology and social justice, but that um, the folks who are here are makers, right? Like they, they're organizers, they're activists, so they make spaces and they make movements, but they also make stuff, they make media. Um, so one of the things that's super exciting about being here is hearing the kinds of really innovative solutions that people are already um, exploring. And I think particularly around new technologies, we have a tendency to feel like they're more complicated than they really are, or that the solutions are more complex than they really are. And that's kind of a, it's a, it's a form of math washing, right? It's a story we get told about how we're not smart enough to actually understand the systems or, or the solutions to the problems that the systems are supposed to address. And I, I mean, I think the first step is we don't buy that story, right? Is we say, actually, like we might, and, and it's true, there might be a really technically complicated system that takes a little bit of breaking down for us to understand, but we understand the problems and we understand the solutions. And we understand actually even some of the really complicated um, technologies that are out there once we have the language, the basic language to do it. So. Um, I've been here in part with a, in this incredible team of folks I've been working with for the last three years called the Our Data Bodies Project. Um, and one of the things that's really fantastic about that work is that people often assume, you know, folks who are the targets of these most invasive systems just don't understand what's going on. And what we found in two years of interviews is in some of the most marginalized neighborhoods in the United States is people know a lot about what's going on. Um, they already have an analysis of how this stuff is impacting their lives. Um, and even more exciting, they already have solutions, right? So they have solutions around how they do self-defense on a day-to-day -day level and how they survive. Um, but they also have all sorts of really smart policy suggestions and these incredible visions for making more vibrant, more just communities. And so I really think it's about um, listening. Um, and a huge part of my own work is around trying to tell better stories about these systems. Stories that aren't just about how the technologies work, but about how the technologies make people feel, what that experience is like, um, and what it feels like from the inside. And then the impacts it's having on communities right now. Because I think often when we talk about this stuff, we have a tendency to talk about it as if the problems might arise in the future. <laughs> when in fact, a lot of the problems are already happening right now. And I think the other thing that really needs to happen is that we have to be telling our stories. Um, so very much in my role as a storyteller, I feel like part of my work is um, pushing back on the flattening of people's whole selves down to data, right? So one of the ways we talk about it is um, in the Our Data Bodies project is as, as the data body. And the data body is often this sort of flattened, decontextualized story that's written about you based on information that's collected either about you or about people like you. And what we've definitely found as a team during the research is that people resent having their story flattened in that way. And they want to be recognized, they want to be heard, um, uh, and they want to be seen, um, not looked at and analyzed. Um, and they want to be recognized as full human beings in their context.